Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. To welcome Anya Tima. Uh, most of you, well, many of you may recognize her from when she was interning with us quite recently. She's also an MSR scholar. Uh, she's just finished her PhD at Newcastle University's Culture Lab, uh, and today she's going to be talking about designing technology for mental health and well-being. Thank you, Shan, and thank you all for coming this morning. Um, yeah, as Shan was saying, um, well, I'm, I'm a human-computer interaction researcher, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in the design of new technologies that can support meaningfully people's mental health and well-being. Um, so today I would like to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, my PhD research and a project called Spheres of Wellbeing. And I think it's not just quite an interesting project, but also one that shows you quite well how I approach research and sort of research questions that I'm interested in in this area. Now just to start with, I would like to tell you a little bit more about me, my background and what I've been doing in the last couple of years. I studied in Germany, media and communication sciences at the University of Duisburg-Essen. Um, it was pretty much a, a program where you would study how the modules would be computing science, how the modules would be psychology, and there was a little bit of media and arts practice. And I was very much focused on working interdisciplinary and, and projects and groups. And then in the master's, I would focus much more on psychology and social and emotional aspects of human computer interaction. And then for my final year project in the master's, I would join the digital interaction group in Newcastle. It's a group that's led by Patrick Olivier. And at the time, it was, it was quite a small group. There were only 12, 15 people there. And they were all um, coming from different backgrounds. They were engineers, people from social science, um, fine artists. And they would be all working collaboratively on, on different projects. Quite an exciting environment, quite buzzing. So I um, stayed on to do the PhD, fortunately. PhD was funded by Microsoft. This is how I got to, to meet Shan, who became the supervisor, or co-supervisor of this work. And then, as Shan was mentioning, at the end of last year, came to the Cambridge lab to do an internship project. I was working here on the Tennyson Road uh, project. And since I'm a research associate back in Newcastle in the interaction, digital interaction group, um, and the group has now considerably grown in size. We're almost like 100 people. So over the last five, six years doing the master's and the PhD. I've actually come to work on, on quite a range of different projects that can roughly be grouped in these areas. We've been looking at data visualization tools that help people, for instance, with track spotting interesting things that people talk about in online blogs. Or Panoptic is a tool where um, users could spot specific events and video surveillance footage. Um, I've also been working on, on explorations of technology that would help people reflect on themselves and their personal experiences. So Lover's Box is my master's project where I would ask couples in romantic relationships to exchange video messages with their partner and uh, creating these um, videos and exchanging them. And the conversations that would evolve around them would uh, lead to quite a lot of meaningful reflection on, on how they were perceiving their relationships and each other. Um, Bing Chem was quite a different project, it's quite a provocative uh, system where we put smartphones in bins and every time somebody would throw something away, the bin would take a photo of the waste and then would upload that automatically to Facebook. So you could see images of your own waste, but also your peers. And the idea here was A, to, to make you more aware of what kind of, what, how your recycling behavior was or how much food waste you threw away, but also to kind of playfully shame you into showing more sustainable behaviors. Most of my research, though, is uh, focused on health and well-being, ma mainly mental health. And I'm currently working on um, a project around dementia care and also on a technology design, low-cost, low low-tech technology design that um, supports the care provision of Syrian, health, uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon. So quite a range of projects. If you find any of these interesting um, and would like to talk about them more. I'm happy to I just, we'll only be able to really go into the spheres of well-being for the purpose of this talk. <laughs> I've only prepared one for the talk, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, if, any time later, maybe if we get a chance. Um, right, so let me just set a little bit the scene around mental health and well-being and technologies to support that. 
Mental health became pretty much uh, a very important concern for society in 1996 when the World Health Organization was publishing a report that was kind of showing how much mental illness has increased and not just how much it impacts on the individual but actually the worldwide economy. It was a real big burden. People would stay out of work and so there was this need to, to think about ways of um, getting mental health, mental illness assessed but also support treatment. The problem is that a lot of people that will require treatment actually don't receive it, partly because of social stigma that's attached to, to mental health, people wouldn't seek support, but also because actually a lot of therapies, especially psychotherapies, are quite cost intensive. So maybe technology can help here. And so very many of the early interventions were digitalized forms of self-help materials and therapeutic strategies. Um, they were often based on uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very effective psychotherapy, but also one that's very structured. So you can, it lends itself kind of to, to translate that into a digital format. And that would be made available to people on waiting lists. So Beating the Blues, for instance, was something that was recommended in 2006 by the NHS. Uh, nice guidelines for people who had mild to moderate depression. Um, many of, of the psychotherapies also use the monitoring of your thoughts, uh, emotions and behaviours in relation to certain events during everyday life, um, mainly so you can reflect about you know, your, your own behaviour, but also to apply your coping strategy. So self-monitoring is a really uh, central part of psychotherapy, so there have been a lot of explorations how mobile applications can support people in managing their mental health. So overall, you know, there have been a lot of developments that are actually quite... Um, cost effective if you are a technology literate you know it's, it's easily accessible for you um, you can adapt it to all the sorts of different mental disorders these technology have also um, quite common problems around privacy you know who can access this maybe quite personal data about myself where is it stored but one of the main problems also was attrition so people would stop actually engaging with the technology quite quickly. If you imagine you were, you were coming home after a long work day and you were doing your program of CBT on your computer without having the therapist there guiding you through the process, listening to your problems, giving you homework and encouraging you to, to uh, keep, keep doing um, the program, people would drop out fairly quickly. So most of ACI research in, in recent years on these sort of mental health interventions looking at how you can motivate people to engage more with the therapy contents. There have been um, a lot of explorations into, not a lot, actually fairly, fairly few, um, into using games, particularly in the design um, of interventions for children, so computer games that adolescents would actually work through and work through their problems with the therapists doing therapy sessions. Uh, explorations in how you can use maybe tabletop interfaces doing play therapy to give children more range of, of expressing themselves. And in terms of more standalone online based platforms, um, there were efforts made to create more dynamic ways of how you can access the contents and provide people more immediate feedback on how they're making progress. You could personalize your own profile page. They would also include elements that you could actually contact a therapist or that a therapist in Horizons actually is their therapist moderating the whole interactions with the system and more and more um, peer support was made available either in forms of, of little videos that where people would talk about their experiences or you know chat rooms that were moderated where, where children and young adults would um, for instance in Horizon encourage each other would share their experiences and the ways of how they managed to cope. Now a lot of these uh, existing interventions focus very much on, on supporting the treatment of mental illness. Um, and thereby they're a little bit more informed by quite a medical tradition where you, um, you're trying to solve that problem of illness, you try to cope with an illness. However, I believe that mental health is, is not just the absence of um, mental illness. It's not just, just because we, we don't have a diagnosable mental disorder does not mean we are mentally well, that we're functioning well in everyday life, that we feel, you know, we are resilient against everyday stresses, that we have fulfilling relationships, a sense of purpose and growth, that we feel like we're in control of our lives and that our life is meaningful, which I consider as the more positive take on mental health and, uh, and refer to as mental well-being. So, um, the idea is to maybe look a little bit more holistic on mental health and I believe that if we combine strategies both in the treatment and in supporting mental well-being that, that can, we can improve actually um, the recovery of mental illness and also be working more towards preventative approaches which are currently almost non-existent 
um, and might get a better understanding how we can support people's quality of life more generally as well. So with that research motivation in mind, I'm now going to come extend a little bit more on the spheres of well-being. So the spheres research was targeted at a very specific group of people. Um, it's a group of women, they're mainly in their 20s, they've got seriously severe uh, mental health problems. They also had very challenging behaviours, including severe self-harm. And because of that, because of these problem behaviours, they re required a very structured and secure care environment where they would be looked after properly. And that, in this case, was a medium secure unit in, a, in an NHS hospital. And on top of that, the women also had a mild to moderate learning disability. So they were capable to consent. They, they had good cognitive functioning, but it was limited in some ways. And it's actually not that uncommon for people who have a learning disability to also develop mental health problems in life. It's actually twice as likely than in the general public. So quite a challenging uh, group and context to work in. So, so how did I go about kind of to make sense of, you know, the mental health and well-being needs of the women, how technology could fit with them and their, and their care context? Um, for obvious ethical reasons, it was quite difficult to work with the women in the initial stages. So my approach was to work really closely with uh, different hospital staff who would um, explain to me, you know, how they were working with the women, their understanding of the women and would share the expertise of the care context. They would also point me towards relevant literature, um, you know, about the mental health problems of the women and, and recommended treatment approaches. Um, I would also go through some personal training and staff would show me around the hospital unit so I could get a sense of the environment as well. Now, from that whole collaborative process, it came to understand that the women had um, a condition, it's called borderline personality disorder, it's very much an emotion regulation disorder. So that means the women have real problems to understand and regulate their own emotions. And that's tricky because that means they're quite often overpowered by emotional pain. You know, they have low, low mood, they feel quite hopeless and helpless, and therefore it's really difficult to engage them in therapy. But also, if you can't really regulate strong emotional pain, you tend to behave impulsive, you can show aggression towards other people, and you engage in a lot of self-harm because some of the physical pain distracts you from that strong emotional pain. And if you all have all these problems, it's also quite difficult to, to have a strong and stable and positive sense of self. So the women have a lot of cognitive disturbances. They overvalue the idea of being bad, that they don't deserve anything nice, that they feel they've got no control of their situation. And all of this makes it difficult for them as well to have stable, positive relationships with other people. So quite a, quite a complex condition. So how, how do you translate that into um, requirements for the design and, and uh, how do you go about this? So there are quite a few challenges here and I mean not just in terms of technology design but also in terms of how you design the research activities. One of the main concerns, especially of the hospital staff, were around safety. Wherever the technology was, it needed to be safe. And that was because of, of the severe self-harming behaviour. So if you're thinking about technology, you know, any metal piece, any broken off piece of a screen could be used to scratch yourself. If you had access to batteries, you could lick them. If you broke off a little piece, you can put that under your eyelid. There are loads of ways of how you can uh, do harm to yourself. So I was a bit like, so what can I do? How, how can I know how I can fabricate a technology that might be safe enough? Um, so I was shown around the unit and, and I would come to realise that actually a lot of the furniture is mounted either against the wall or uh, and you see the table areas on the bottom picture, the, they're like screwed to the floor. The red chairs look quite cosy but they're super heavy so you couldn't actually move them easily, let alone pick up and throw at somebody. Um, there's <coughs> like a TV inside this furniture piece that's covered by a transparent purse bag so you can't get to the TV. Um, the, the curtains are made from a tear-proof material, so you couldn't rip them apart to strangle yourself. There aren't any plant pots or images that you could take off the wall. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just for the purpose of the image. And then Steph would also show me around, you know, the seclusion room, which is a, like a soft padded room where you have got soft padded furniture from prison service, all in blue, um, all quite, yeah, not, not quite, quite nice, but there were materials that were considered robust enough. Uh, to give to the women. So it's clear, you know, you have to protect technology, make sure that whatever it is that you design it, it's safe. In this context, safety also extended a little bit more towards me and safeguarding my own 
personal health coming into the environment. So I went through training, you know, where they would teach me how to be at least an arm's length distance to the women at all times. I was not allowed to wear anything you could pull on, like a scarf or earrings. Hair had to be put up. I was wearing an alarm system at all times to request help if I needed to. Um, and also there was always at least one member of staff there with me um, in case something would be happening. Another design challenge evolved around the, the learning disability of the women and, and bringing consideration to the fact that the attention span might not be that, um, that large. You know, you shouldn't be um, constructing long and complicated sentences. It was important that the language was easy or maybe just not to use too much text and to support it by either pictorial pictures or just create something that is very visual and stimulating. Obviously, a key consideration was as well the sort of therapy that the women were um, receiving. In this case, this was dialectical behavior therapy. The staff would point me towards it, and I would talk it through with the clinical care team of the women. And DBT is a specialist treatment for borderline personality disorder, which is the women's condition. It builds a little bit on cognitive behavioral therapy, where you get taught how to perhaps restructure your thinking. Um, but the, the twist and the difference here is that it also includes acceptance-based strategies, which are very much informed from Zen Buddhism, that teach you that you have to accept yourself, you're good at who you are, and you also have to accept the things you can't change. And that's, that's very important for people who have an emotional disability, where if you are very emotional, you have to learn to recognize your emotions and calm your emotions down. <laughs> Imagine you're really angry or really sad, you know, I can't reason about a problem with you in that state. You have to learn to calm yourself down first. And so the two uh, acceptance-based skills are taught as part of DBT, distress tolerance, teaches you how you distract yourself from whatever is troubling you without you know, cutting yourself. A, the idea is to, to, to suggest certain strategies that are as effective, but they don't cause you any harm. And mindfulness is a, is a key part where you learn about uh, being more attentive to yourself, be more aware of yourself and your experiences. And that is very much taught in a way that you, as a concentration-based exercise, so you, you learn how to focus on one thing at a time and to only focus on that and not get distracted by any other things. Often it's taught as a breathing exercise where you focus on your breathing and how it feels like to breathe in and out. And whenever you feel you get distracted, you just redirect your focus on that exercise. And mindfulness in particular is, um, has become really, really popular in mental health. It's been used for a lot of different um, disorders. It's very, been, been very successful with post-traumatic stress disorders, depression, etc. And it's just it's focused on recognizing your emotion and dealing with them. Now, lastly, I was also quite interested, looking at the mental well-being um, perspective of things, to create something that was quite person-centered. I didn't just want to replicate you know, existing DBT strategies and practices that the women were doing already. I wanted to create something that um, I felt that didn't feel very medical or formal or generic, but rather something that was quite personal and unique to each of the women, and create experiences that and, and interactions that they may not have had before, particularly because the staff were saying, actually, the women are quite computer literate. You know, they love playing the computer games. They can download things. So there was a lot of potential here. And also, you know, because of the challenging behaviors and safety regulations, women didn't have many objects in their room that could tell a story about them, that would express their individuality. Um, so I was quite keen to, to, to create, like, a tangible design, something that they could personalize, that was theirs to keep and to take with them when they would leave the ward. So, how do the spheres respond to these design challenges? So, overall, the spheres are a set of three artifacts that were co created with each of the women. The first one is the mindfulness sphere. It looks a bit like a, a crystal ball, it's made from, from resin. It has copper discs attached to either side, and when you hold the artifact, and you, you make contact with copper. There's custom ECG electronics at the inside that can assess your heart rate or your heartbeat. And then there are lights that would visualize this. Um, let me show you this. This is in a really short video. So at the inside, there's six multicolor LEDs, and they would just fade in and out with every beat of the heart. And the idea is here to, to teach the women to focus on this visual. And if they get distracted, actually the sphere changes color every 30 seconds to kind of motivate them to keep focusing on that visual as a way to teach them mindful awareness. How does 
constructed. <laughs> Can you hold that question? Um, okay. So the idea just behind behind the concept is to to um, to provide the women something that they can bring focused attention to that they might find stimulating, uh, and that provides them some sort of you know visual feedback on the inner sensation of the body. Like breathing exercises are quite popular because there's something there you can focus your attention on, and a lot of mindfulness activities are, are quite abstract. So this is some of the things that motivated the design. Obviously, clinician quite like as well the biofeedback component of it um, and, and the opportunities it can provide for self-regulation. Overall, obviously, this was um, a kind of a compromise in the design in terms of safety. So it was um, an object that would safely encapsulate all the electronics inside the resin, but at the same time it was solid. So if you would throw that, somebody would hurt. And also if you were throwing it with the right intensity and the right angle, it could break. I've tried all that. Um, however, staff preferred that to using a softer material like rubber because they were saying, you know, have you tried, can you bind it? And you can get in with your teeth. And so um, they found it easier to manage the risks around the sphere when, um, as a solid object. And they would only give it to the women when they were fairly, fairly stable. And for mindfulness, that's important. You would only be able to attend and practice mindfulness in a fairly stable state anyway. So staff felt this was a risk they couldn't manage. So in that sense, it was a bit of a trade-off. Um, so your question was to, how do you know they're destructed? So have you ever tried mindfulness? yourself or any sort of meditation techniques. If, if I was telling you just to focus um, on your breathing, you would probably realize that after a couple of seconds, you would actually think maybe about the next meeting you have or lunch. It's, it's something that actually happens. Your mind always drifts away. And, and the trick is to notice that your mind drifts away. And then just like, oh, hold on. I was supposed to be concentrating on my breathing. And you would focus your attention back on your breathing. And this is how you learn, just to focus on one thing at a time. It's actually really difficult. So I've, I've attended a mindfulness class myself for many weeks and I found it really, really difficult um, because we're not that good actually to just concentrate on one thing. Our mind tends to drift off. But the, but the key is that you're non-judgmental, that you accept that and you just focus again. So it will definitely have happened to whoever uh, practiced mindfulness. So, but question. I, I think it's, it's not like the, the sphere detects that you've a, a drifted away. It just assumes that you have and, and changes color every 30 seconds. No, no, no. The, the, the color change is just, in this case, program in. It's just so that you just have different stimuli. It's just to make it more stimulating. I was even thinking about make, giving it like a bit more of a haptic feedback, but then that would have, in this case, interfered a little bit with the sensor readings. Um, no, so it's just to make it stimulating. You could practice mindfulness on focusing on the chair, but that's just not as so easy. The color change, you assume, just because you've noticed that, yeah, that you're like, oh, hold on. You know when, you, when your mind drifts away and then you realize, oh, there's a color change. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to be focusing on that. It's more that sort of creating a visual stimuli that keeps you engaged. It just, it just switches on when contact's made, but it yeah. doesn't react to any other input except touch. So it basically it switches on when you touch both sides of yeah. the sphere, stops when you turn off. Yeah. So I'd imagine, for example, that the light will, would react to your heartbeat, but no, <coughs> it's just on off. Well, the light f fades in and out with the speed of your heart. Oh, it doesn't you know, yeah, so it reacts to that. Yeah, it is your, it's a visualization of your heartbeat. But it, it, the, the changes in color are hard coded in this case. Every 30 seconds, it will change color. Do they have a goal to the heart rate down? Or are they given any goals? So, you could do that. You could, for instance, do breathing to calm yourself down, and it might reflect in the visual. But the idea of mindfulness is not to change, it's to accept. So I could have, you know, have made the lights red if the heartbeat was really fast and green if it was slow, but that would be a judgment. That would be more around uh, strategies for change your behavior and adapt your behavior, whereas this was about acceptance. So in, in fact, most of the, of the lights are more like purple or turquoise or um, orange. I tried not to put any value statements into that, and that was a deliberate choice to, to stay with the mindfulness philosophy behind it. Um, yeah. Can I also ask, you, can yeah. Ask, you said it's something personal that you can keep, but you also said the staff keep hold of it. So isn't that at odds with the idea that it's theirs? So at this date, how do the staff keep hold of it? You said that they brought it out when when the patients were calm, which implies that yeah, they so, um, don't actually have control over when they can. So that's true. And it, so I had six women. Two of them had free access to the artifacts at any time. 
to add intermediate access. That, mean, that meant when they had a good week, they could use it. When they weren't well in other weeks, staff had to look over the artifact and then decide are the risk behaviors of the women uh, appropriate enough that, they can, that it's safe for them to have the object. And two of the women were, their behaviors were generally quite high risk. So they would always have to ask staff for stuff, they would always have to accommodate it for them to have, especially the mindfulness here, simply because it's this robust, solid object that is a, an object of danger. So it, it actually depends on the individual risks of the women and that can, they, those can change over time as well. Um, second object is the identity sphere. Uh, it looks a little bit like a little leather purse. Can you go through the evaluation of it? The, the, the staff's experience of it or anything like that? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so this, per, this object looks a little bit like a purse. Um, it has a smartphone at the inside. When you open it up, there's a screen visible. The screen is protected by a Perspex cover. The artifact made is from leather. Leather is tearproof. It's actually been a very robust artifact. Um, and when you, when you uh, open it up, there is a, a little button at the top of the purse. When you press that button, there's an application running on the phone that um, switches on the camera function and would scan the environment for QR codes. So embedded the center of these uh, colorful patterns and mandalas. Uh, and if they recognize a QR code, that would trigger the display of a video. Now, the videos were things that were co-created with each of the women, and the idea behind them was to reflect things that the women were interested in, personal, per, positive personal experiences, people who were meaningful to them, things that they were proud of, and the idea was to help here, to help to um, support them in the construction of a more positive sense of self. And the last object of the three is the calming sphere. So this one is non-digital. Uh, it was supposed to be just a very simple artifact that, that very much reflects the concept of, of uh, secular worry beads. You know, it's just something you can hold on to and play with when you get a little nervous or anxious. Um, obviously, you could use it for relaxation practices. You might, you know, you could count the beads one after the other, or you, you could bring mindful awareness to, to the different visual patterns that were on the beads. Again, safety considerations. It's a leather strap. It's only just long enough to rip fit around the, the women's wrists, the clay beads where staff were saying, you know, even if the women swallow them, they're probably going to be safe for them to have. So these are the three artifacts, and the concept uh, behind them and the idea for the artifacts pretty much evolved through my collaboration with the hospital staff, some of the previous research I've been doing, and also um, uh, some, uh, some of my personal experience of being kind of in this environment and getting a sense of um, what we might like to design. But it's not, it's not been anything where the women were really involved in until this point. So it's very much important that the women also somewhat contributed to the co-creation of the artifacts. So um, I invited them for, for a period of five weeks, once a week, to engage in a series of creative activities where they would come to personalize uh, pieces and elements and contents of the spheres. So we would, for instance, um, make beads from polymer clay. So working with FEMO, and we would also work with, with certain techniques, like, you know, the top right is like, if you, if you know certain techniques, you can create actually quite nice symmetrical patterns, we've used tools to create mosaics, so even if you had no arts and crafts skills, you could actually create quite beautiful, intricate designs, um, so the women would make their own calming spheres. We would then work with um, acrylic paint and stamps, and we would work on special plastic paper that when you cut out your design and you put it in the oven, would shrink to a much smaller size and you would create this little um, plastic charms that the women then would choose to have incorporated inside their mindfulness spheres. They also designed the look of the leather purses, you know, what kind of pockets, engravings, and ornaments, colors they wanted to do, and that was then the design brief for me. Um, they had a lot of different black and white mandala patterns where they could choose their favorite ones and color those in. And at the center, I would then add on the QR code that worked with their identity sphere. And it is that each identity sphere would only work with the particular um, QR codes of the women. So that was a kind of a consideration for privacy. You need to imagine that in a secure unit, you're constantly observed. And, the, and that includes even the most intimate spaces. When you're under the shower, when you go to the toilet, even when you sleep, there's just no space for privacy or for keeping something to yourself that other people can't access. Um, so I wanted to create something where the women had the choice, you know, whether they wanted to share the videos with other people. Um, I also uh, created 
um, paper tokens to, to help you know, create conversations with the women around what the sort of things they like and, and um, they're interested in, to start stimulating ideas about what could be part of their videos for the identity spheres. We'd also make a video together. So I, I taught the women how they can do little stop motion animations, just using uh, simple paper cutouts and showing them how they can animate them using a, a very simple phone app. One of the women was really keen in terms of horror movies. She went crazy on a, on a graveyard and screen masks and made a really, really beautiful animation. So, what, what were the findings from this process? Um, I have to admit that before I started these activities, I was pretty much prepared for all the problem behaviors of the women. Everybody was asking me, are you sure they're going to understand the activities? Are they going to engage with them? Are they going to be able to concentrate? Are they going to get it? How are they going to respond to you? Oh my God, it was apprehensive, to say the least, to go into the mime and having everything set up, having to watch everything. I had no idea how it's going to go. Um, unfortunately, and very much to my relief, it went pretty well. Um, the women were very, very much enjoying taking part in these activities. It was something they were actually really committed to. So they would engage actually up to three hours. They would skip even cigarette breaks, which apparently is really rare. Um, and and they, they love taking part. And I've come to, I came to understand that over, over the weeks, this was very much related to how we set up the activities. There was a lot of consideration made about creating a safe and comfortable space for the women. Staff members were there supporting them that knew the women well. Um, also, it was quite a hands-on activity, you know, you were making things, it wasn't putting the women on the spot. Everybody would chip in, it became quite a casual engagement. It was also something where you didn't need any skills, you could create quite, quite amazing looking pieces without, you know, having to have any prior knowledge and you would learn skills and, and the women were really proud of what they could achieve in such short time. Um, obviously, it was very individualized, the women got a lot of personal attention, it was all one-on-one. -on -one. Usually what they do is in group activities and would be less creatively adventurous. So they would be having a coloring book and a pen and they would for an hour sit there and they were coloring something in. Um, whereas here it was, was quite different. And they also enjoyed how loads of positive interactions would evolve with the staff and, and in that setting that was again quite different to how they would interact with the staff on the ward where the staff would be, you know, their key responsibility is to, to organize the women's care, to get them in, out of bed in the mornings, you know, make sure they have the medication, go to therapy, whereas here it was all about the women, their choices, their interests and assisting them to create something that they wanted to make. And I think it's partly because it was so different to many of the other activities that they enjoyed uh, this process and were quite committed to it. Um, and also, I mean, there's something interesting to say here about um, how, how much it was actually about the person and not the illness. So a lot of the time, and I didn't notice it when I did it, when I was in these activities, I would feel so comfortable with the women because they were so lovely, they were so well behaved that I completely forgot about the risk behaviours and would kind of quite often move towards them, would lean forward, sometimes even found myself sitting almost next to them and staff let me, quite often they let me get away with it because it was just, you know, it didn't feel like there was any threat to be expected. However, with some women where the risk behaviours were incredibly high, I really pushed staff's anxiety levels, they, weren't, they were not happy with me, there was a lot of frustration going on, they would be kicking me under the table, they would, you know, assign to me back off because I didn't understand what it means to be attacked, I didn't, I've, I never had any experience of that, I was just a little bit oblivious to that, I just simply in that situation would forget the implications that it could have, something was happening. But I think that somewhat also carries a little bit of the beauty of having this, these moments together. Okay. Having taken part in these creative activities, the spheres were then finalized back in, in Newcastle and then deployed. Um, and for the first 15 weeks of the deployment, I would um, observe how the women would be engaging with the objects. I would conduct interviews with the women and the staff and after the first, fourth and 15th week of the uh, deployment, I would also every now and then be in, in, in the environment, not to observe anybody, but mainly I was kind of hanging about waiting to see staff or waiting to meet the women, where you get a lot of really good insights into the environment. Um, when I wasn't at the hospital, and that was for most of the 15 weeks, I've left staff with diaries and little uh, postcards where they could leave notes of what they might have observed of the women interacting with the spheres. And I would also talk a lot about my experiences and how it made sense of the research with, um, 
with a collaborator at the hospital who was the R&D manager at the hospital and would debrief my experiences, but it would also, you know, she would help me put everything into perspective and make sense and, and give context information that were really essential for me to understand what was actually going on. And all the information collected went into thematic analysis. And so I'm now very quickly going to give you like just a snapshot of some of the findings that came out of that as to how the women experience in the spheres. One of the things that came out is that because the women were so involved in the co-creation of them, they were actually um, quite proud of the objects and they also had quite a strong sense of ownership. I mean, they were their creations, they were their sort of contents that were in there. Um, so particularly initially, they were actually even very protective about the objects. And staff were saying to me, you know, I think they just really enjoy possessing them and knowing that it's theirs and that they could choose if they wanted to use them. So in the first week, second week, they were showing these objects to anybody that they possibly could. The other women on the flat, staff members, even family members doing visits. And that created a lot of positive interactions where the women would just say, you know, how do they work technically? They would explain that, how it had contributed to them, um, and also, you know, how the contents were relevant to them. And they were damn proud. And other people would recognize the achievements that they had. And that was a really positive experience. So, for instance, uh, one staff member was saying, Kim, she seemed really, really proud of it, which is a really good thing because it's possible she might not have a lot of things that she's proud of, but you could see she was sort of brimming with pride, showing me her spheres. And f for those women, that, that's why it's especially, you know, there are not many occasions where they felt they were achieving something and other people would recognize that. Um, in particular, the videos and the identity spheres would also enable the women to kind of be reminded of, of happy memories and happy times and people actually that care about them. And that was important because um, sometimes they needed that reminder. They, they, they were sometimes just thinking, you know, life has no meaning. And, and, you know, they needed that motivation as well to keep, keep going with therapy. What is it all worth, worthwhile for? And so one of the women was saying, you know, when she was using... Um, her identity sphere, she would play a video that showed a lot of images with her and her mum. And she would say, oh, my mum's one. It makes me feel more confident, like that I want to get out of here. I look at her mom, my mum, I think, I think that I should have more confidence in myself. So some reassurance here. Um, they were also using the spheres as a way to keep well. So in some ways, the objects, because they were related and associated with a lot of positive experience in the, in the making, they became some sort of objects of comfort, something that they turned to when the women were feeling a little bit low or lonely and just wanted to feel connected to family. They were really uh, missing family quite a bit. But they would also use the objects if they were bought and there was no other sort of, of stimulation around. And it's really a problem if you don't have anything to do. If you're left by yourself, you start ruminating. Problems come up. So having something to do it's actually um, quite, quite important. And the women would also use it when they, when they were a bit distressed. There was an important therapy meeting coming up. They wanted to relax. They wanted to take their mind off these or to escape the flat dynamics. So you need to imagine if you're on a, on a ward where all the women have severe emotion regulation difficulties, you know, if one of them gets upset, it affects everyone. If you're that day in a good space and you don't want to be affected by it, having the opportunity to say to staff, I would like to go in my room and use my spheres and escape that setting, that would be a way you know, to, to keep yourself well and manage that and, and escape that situation. One of the staff said about Janet, who was one of the women, she said she liked to look at it. This is about the pairs first. It made her feel happy, made her feel that she wasn't on her own. With the ball, she also said she, was, she would sit in her room and feel close to something. So somewhat, there were these objects that, not necessarily that the women could articulate this very well, but they were objects um, of comfort. And I have to say, and this is like probably something about how I made sense of the data, so a lot of the times when I was working with women, it's not that easy for them to understand why they were doing certain things or how they were feeling about it, uh, or were able to articulate, in particular, one of the women. She would quite often just use one-word answers. It's not that easy you know, to engage them in conversation about their experiences. There was also a strong research effect. So, because I was so involved with the women, they would be quite reluctant to tell me, oh, yeah, well, if there was something that they didn't like about the spheres or and they were re refusing to use them or didn't want to use them, they wouldn't tell that to me straight away. But that's where the staff, again, 
came in who would be very happy to volunteer all the moments where it wasn't going well uh, and set things into perspective and would volunteer their interpretation of what they thought was going on between the women and the spheres. Um, the staff also suggested a lot of users around the sphere. So because these were objects that the women generally responded to quite positively, staff gave them to them or suggested them to the women at times when they were going towards crisis, when they were getting more and more distressed, because they had the hope that if they were using the object, they would just get distracted and maybe you know, an incident could be prevented from happening. That was not the case. In fact, a lot of the time when the women were getting distressed, they refused to use them. They didn't want to engage with them. Even if they were engaging them, they would throw the objects. So in this case, it was only ever going to be the purse that would be given to them, and it was thrown quite a few times. So it were the stickers. Um, but fortunately, it was robust enough for that purpose. Um, but yeah, that let staff be quite disappointed that, that, that the women weren't engaging more with the objects, especially in these moments where it was like most needed. So it kind of shows that staff were quite desperate to have something, a tool that would help the women and them to deal with these most difficult uh, events and moments. But that is a different approach uh, to mindfulness or a, a DBT culture. Now, um, a DBT culture didn't really exist in this hospital just yet. It was something that was newly introduced, but most of the practices on the wall was there was a problem and how do we deal with this effectively. Um, so other than me facilitating mindfulness activities with the women, and if once I um, had also a therapist, a facilitating group session with all the women around mindfulness, mindfulness practices wouldn't really happen. And that's mainly because the women uh, were still at the, at the beginning of learning how to do mindfulness and they need a lot of support by the staff. Now, most of the ward staff didn't really know how to make sense of mindfulness or engage the women in practice either. So that was something that was, was just not engaged with as much. Um, actually, this is, this is one of the ward managers I've been talking to at the end, like talking about the overall experience. And he was quite honestly admitting, you know, DBT groups are relatively new. Um, you know, maybe we're a little bit behind with the staff training. It's not completely alien to them. But if you ask sort of to give a detailed account about mindfulness, then the majority of the people will probably just remember what it is. So it was just, yeah. Uh, what DBT, again? DBT is the dialectical behavior therapy. So this is, yeah. Um, Nevertheless, there were moments where the women were using the spheres successfully for self-destruction, usually when they were calming down after an incident, and it would just help them to take their mind off things and, and just to calm and relax afterwards. So there were many examples of that too, but just not when, when they were really, really distressed. Um, overall, there were a lot of challenges to facilitate engagement in that context, one of which was the lack of understanding in some ways of DBT and how to facilitate that within that context. Part was the artifact safety. So the mindfulness sphere wasn't as safe. It was the identity sphere that was used the most, and partly because that was an object that was considered safe enough for the women to use. Um, so because not all the women had free access, some had the objects in the room, but again, behind the perspex cupboard. There was only one key to that cupboard that was shared between two flats. Identifying that one member of staff on duty that had that key and getting that cupboard open alone was a challenge. It could easily take half an hour. It's generally quite difficult to facilitate person-centered engagements in the war environment that's super hectic. There's so many staff involved in the women's service. So just to support the research activity on the ward, I recruited 47 staff, but there were many more. They were rotating in shifts, mostly support workers. It's a very expensive service and you know, qualified nurse um, have higher salaries. And obviously the main uh, responsibility of the staff was to safeguard the women and, and to look after their, their, their daily care. Um, there's also the challenge around this being kind of an external project. You know, it's, it's been supported for a certain period of time, um, but then for integrating something like that into services in the long run is, is another challenge. So if you think about, I was talking to staff a lot about opportunities maybe to create evening activities where they could just use it all in a group. But then pretty early on in the deployment, one of the women moved to the low secure unit. So she was on her own with her spheres on that unit. And then her place had been taken by a new admission. 
So she was left out. So unless you know you roll it roll it out across the, the service, unless it's introduced hierarchically top down by the NHS and part of the, the guidelines of care, it's really difficult to enable um, long term engagement. So just to wrap up, um, I hope I could show that the spheres had some sort of potential in supporting um, a positive sense of self in the women. The interactions were enabling them to feel proud and achieving and also to remind them about um, people who care about them and their individuality. They were also using them as a way to manage their own well-being, either to distract themselves or calm them down after an incident, or as objects of comfort, something that provided stimulation and take their mind off other things. In general, explorations around mindfulness came short. It's clearly something that's been underexplored in that context. But although there are a lot of technology developments around mindfulness, a lot of apps that support you, research on mindfulness in ACI is actually rather underexplored. It's something I would like to continue in the future. I would also like to continue developing the agenda for mental well-being as like this positive take on mental health and to push this more holistic view on mental health. And also in this project, as well as in some of the research I'm doing right now uh, around dementia care provision where um, carers are engaging with people with dementia, there are a lot of tools out there, for instance, to support mindfulness on tablet PCs. A lot of the carers just don't really know how to, to engage with the technology in a meaningful way and engage that other person. So I think there needs to be much more consideration around how you actually design the services and the practices around uh, the, the technology artifact and not just focus on the technology itself. Right, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Loads of people involved. Loads of things as well. Okay, do we have time still for questions? Do you see a distinction between the artifact and the method? Because when you talk about um, the evaluation, you talk about the, the artifact, but in reality it strikes me that the things you describe in terms of the positive outcomes of, of you know, your evaluation relate more to the method, so the, the mm -hmm. active engagement of getting people to involve. So do you see those two things as distinct? Like, Could you have the spheres and those kind of environments still have the same outcomes, or would it have to be that quite probably expensive and complicated method that you've described in order to create them? Yeah, so I see them as completely interlinked, and I think the the impact that the spheres could have in the latest. So it, it has been two stages. And it's kind of somewhat in a shame because I think if you were continuing involving the women around practices of, um, around the spheres, you could actually have much more benefit, I think, in the long run. So in this process, it seemed like that the creative activities were actually much more powerful than maybe the interactions of the spheres. And I think partly this is because so much engagement with the women around the creative activities that then were pretty much lacking when I left the hospital and left them with the artifacts by themselves. So th this is pretty much what we're hinting at. There need to be practices around um, the artifacts that make these engagements more meaningful, and that was somewhat lacking. So they are separable. And I believe if you were not uh, creating these, uh, involving this creative approach and you would just give them a set of spheres, then it would be just a more generic technology. Um, so maybe the, the beauty in this is the whole process around it. Does that answer the question? It does, yes. Thank you. Now, most designers spend their time when they do presentations ex describing their artfulness, the way they assemble things. And, um, and I find that somewhat perplexing because sometimes you find little about the world in which that might, those devices might be thrown in. And in this case, you spent most of your time describing the world in which they were thrown in. And I'm then wondering what you think yourself as. Are, what, do you think yourself as a designer, or do you think yourself as, as? I see myself as a human computer interaction researcher, where the technology is. So I think the spheres pretty much gave me another opportunity to understand that research context and what role technology can play in it. It's not something that is a means to an end where I arrived at a product, it was something that enabled me to do more research in that context and understand that context and understand that people's experiences as a way to inform technology design for mental health and well-being. So I see myself more as a researcher that uses these as tools to do research. Do women still have these um, yes. devices? Yes, so yeah, they do. And, and do they They're need, theirs. Do they need maintaining and do you um, need so to if, um, for the first 12 months, we guarantee that if there are any technical problems, we 
do any repairing, fortunately. So the, and I think this is pretty amazing, given that they are technology prototypes. The balls are still all working. We hadn't had a single problem with them. Knock on wood. Um, the mindfulness, uh, with the identity spheres, there were two instances, one of which was the app was crushing. We had considered for that, so if, um, if that was happening, we just advised the women, you know, let the phone run out of battery and then charge it, and when you switch it on, it would reset, and that works. Um, so that happened once, and it happened actually on the first day of the deployment, so um, the women are quite impatient, so they were like, can you fix it immediately? So I did that, I took the phone out, we started it manually, and stitched it back in. Um, and there was another instance, and that was actually my fault, where one of the women, it was actually in the 10th week, um, she had always looked really well after the artifacts. She had free access. She was using it. She was charging it. But then at some point, it ran out of battery. And that phone didn't have the latest software update. So that whole, you know, you let it run out of battery, you start to switch it back on, didn't work. And that was my fault because I last minute exchanged that phone with a demo phone and just wasn't aware that it didn't have the latest version. And ever since I reversed that and put the software update on it, it was fine. So you're still using it exactly. <laughs> Not actively, they still have them, but that's exactly the problem. It's like one of these things that you could be using, but it's, it's how they're supported in using them. So some of them do. I've got one person in particular who's very keen, and, and, but she has by now left the hospital. Uh, she, well, she's been transferred to low secure and then transferred to a different low secure unit. Um, but no, most, most of them are not actively used anymore. And that's, it's, it's quite a shame, but you know, if, if I now come into the unit and I'm still visiting the women, most of the staff are different. You know, they don't even know they exist. They don't know how to use them. And I was in the rooms. The, the objects were then, they, they were in this, this black box. You know, it's almost like the project is over. Staff puts them all back in the box and puts them in a cupboard. And they're forgotten about really easily. So I think it's a lot more about human interactions around objects, no matter what, tech, I truly believe that whatever technology I would have brought into, this is what I mean with like, it's a research project, you accommodate this. It's just too much hassle, there's so much going on, you know, and, and this is related to any sort of person-centered activity that they could facilitate. It's just very, very difficult in that context. Right.